Okay, I can see that we've, we've got quite a few people on, so we'll make a start. Um, good morning, everybody. My name's Ben Go. I'm the commercial manager here at Mailer Forest Nurseries, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our first ever webinar. Um, it's the first time we've done anything like this before, so we're very excited and we're very pleased that you could join us. So by way of setting the scene, um, I don't think it's too dramatic to say that uh, we've got some fairly urgent challenges uh, that we face from an environmental and, and socio-economic point of view. Um, but the good news is that trees can and, and must play a part in that, uh, in addressing those challenges. And actually the people on this webinar today, we, we all work with trees, so we all uh, play a part in that as well. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to be bold, we have to be open to sharing new ideas, receiving new ideas, uh, and building our, our knowledge and understanding so that we can uh, critically assess what our options are and what the right course of action is. So it's in that spirit that we're hosting the webinar today. Uh, and without further ado, let's talk about what we're going to cover. So the format today, uh, there'll be three short presentations covering um, the uh, various topics uh, around the nursery, uh, and there'll be uh, some time for questions at the end. So the three presentations we've got today. So our first presentation uh, will be on the mini plug facility. Uh, we'll then have uh, a presentation about the wider activities around the nursery and some of the other things we're doing. Uh, and then we'll talk about our somatic embryogenesis lab. Uh, for any, uh, anybody who's been here before, you'll know that there's a huge amount of um, activities, diverse things and people um, around the nursery and we could quite easily spend a day or two um, sort of walking around the nursery and seeing all those things. It, it takes a long time to cover them. Uh, we're gonna try and compress it into 45 minutes. So there will be things that we, we can't cover, uh, but hopefully it gives a flavor of, uh, of what we do, a glimpse of what we do and, and who we are. Um, so on to the first presentation. So the first presentation will be given by Mark O'Neill. Uh, Mark O'Neill is our nurseries director. Uh, he joined us in 2018 and he oversees the operations on the two nursery sites. Um, he'll talk about the uh, mini plug facility, how it, um, you know, the, the development of it and how it improves the quality of what we grow. Uh, and how it helps to address the challenges that we see coming down the road, uh, not least around the changing climate and you know, constraints of the labour market. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, a very good morning to uh, our audience online. Um, I would like to offer you a very warm welcome to your webinar uh, and thank you for your interest in our company and our process. So to begin, um, I would like to show you a short video uh, from around the nursery showing you the, the process and uh, in the fields as such. And then onto your uh, mini plug operation, which you will have seen a lot of coverage of, uh, I suppose, on the internet and for uh, a few of you that have been to our site already. And then finally, I'll take you through a, a presentation, which will hopefully give you um, a better insight into Mailer Forest Nurseries and, and where we are today. So as Ben said, um, please, if you do have any questions, send them into your uh, Q&A box and we will proceed with the video, please. Uh, welcome to Miller Forest Nurseries. Um, this is uh, one of our fields of uh, Sitka spruce seedlings. Fairly typical uh, of our traditional production to date, I would say. Um, what we're looking at here is an A13 
uh, intentions for a two plus one crop. So these were sown in uh, April 21. They will be transplanted this summer uh, for sale in uh, December 23. Target size is a 3050 uh, is what we would like. While they look good, uh, we still want to improve this and, and the, the reason being is that we even within this crop which I would say is is not bad at all we, we, we still see a lot of variability here which again when we transplant uh, and send out to our customers they, um, they like a, a better quality a more consistent crop. Due to legislation uh, I suppose due to uh, labour or a desire from labour to um, handle these type of crops. Uh, this was a decision or which helped our decision to make a huge investment uh, in our own mini plug facility that we'll see later on. Um, again, uh, this traditional type of uh, establishment um, is not so efficient in the use of our seed as well so we're very conscious not to, to waste seed and again our, our new greenhouse gives us the facility to, facility to select the, the best vigorous seeds in-house we can grade those also to give us an even better germination and of course then with our precision seeding we can ensure that every seed's a winner and in turn produce up to 30 million seedlings every year that are of more consistent in size with each other. It's bare root production so we we cultivate these soils um, down to between 30 and 40 centimetres as a primary cultivation, uh, which gives us good drainage. This land uh, has been in this type of production for many years, um, and we're very conscious of the fact that when we harvest our trees, we remove all of the organic matter. So we feel now that this is the right time to, to put some organic matter back and improve the drainage of our soils and our overall, overall health. And where we have done that in the past, more recently in the last couple of years, we can see the benefits already. As a secondary cultivation, we, we simply create the beds. We use a, a steel seed bed method, which allows us to germinate weeds, take those out and then multiple times and then sow the crop. This field has been quite successful. Some of the other fields, maybe not so much, but I, for us, certainly on this nursery, uh, this type of seedbed establishment, due to uh, the fact that we can't use basimate anymore as a soil sterilant, uh, the right decision for us is to establish our seedlings in a more protected environment. Again, another reason for going away from this type of production is um, it's actually quite risky. Um, especially even this summer, we can see the spikes in, in the hot temperatures. This crop in particular has been undercut already. If you look carefully through it, you can see in one or two places, um, there's, a, there's a stress element coming into the crop. And um, we, we want to ensure supply. We want to ensure um, continuing quality in what we do. Uh, I see this type of production as well as being not so environmentally friendly anymore. Um, we use a lot of water on these crops. Uh, you can see from the sprinklers in the background. We broadcast a lot of fertilizer on these crops as well. Um, again, weather dependent, uh, it can be hit or miss. Uh, and then of course, uh, as I mentioned briefly before, the, um, the restrictions that we have for labor. Um, and as we well know, and I've seen in this uh, nursery over the last few years, uh, it's, it's not about numbers of people, uh, it's about the quality uh, of people and the desire from people to actually do this type of work and, uh, and handle these, these type of plants. Okay, so what we can, uh, or what we refer to uh, and this crop in particular is variability. So we can see from these half a dozen plants that I've just taken at random, uh, we have ranges of sizes. Uh, for example, one probably close to 15 centimeters, another one at 10, 
another one at four, another one back at 10, um, and again, another one probably over 15. So the issues that that, that gives us later on, if we, if we don't select the plants at this stage, um, they're transplanted directly from this bed to another bed. Um, but then the, the problem that that creates uh, throughout the growing period is that when we further harvest those when they're ready for the forest, uh, we've got to grade these plants individually uh, at that time and we have huge differences in size um, for every plant that, or for every seed that was sown at the same time in the same place. Um, again, the factors around that is being exposed to all elements um, and hopefully we can mitigate that uh, when we sow the same seeds in our, our new facility to give us a much more even and consistent crop. I just want to introduce you now to our new uh, mini plug facility that I made reference to in the field before. Um, what we can see here is a state-of-the-art state structure. It covers 25,000 square meters, which has the total capacity for 30 million seedlings. Uh, and then down to the right, we can see our water collection tanks that we, we harvest off the roof. Um, the project is almost the near completion. We have been uh, planning this for a number of years. Uh, we started construction July, August last year. Uh, you can see after the topsoil was removed, we left with a, a very favorable site. Uh, it's very free draining, um, which enabled us to work through the winter months and, uh, and clear the site and make really good preparation for the, for the building. Uh, the main design of this building is, uh, of course, we have the, the opening roof, as you can see, uh, for ventilation, uh, but also it's the specification and the design of the, the covering, uh, which is designed especially for forestry species, uh, and we have seen the benefit of, of that already. Um, amazingly, the last, uh, over the last week, we had some temperatures into the mid-30s, uh, and believe it or not, it was cooler inside the, this uh, greenhouse than what it was outside. And I know some of our friends under glass, uh, they struggled at that point. Um, so overall, uh, you know, we have about half of the house uh, sown already, which, you know, it's about 12 million seedlings. Um, and we're very happy with them to date, albeit a little bit late for the season, but um, we're very hopeful that these will be lined out this, this year uh, for sale next year as even, consistent, uh, even more even and consistent than the material that we've just seen in the field. So if we have a look inside, uh, we can see the, the mechanics and uh, the equipment that we use to, to seed these uh, plugs. What you can see here now is the equipment that we use to process our growing media and uh, also seed water and, and cover our trays that we have uh, growing in the, the area next door. The capacity for this equipment, we could easily seed here uh, a million cells per day, uh, which I was very happy with in an eight hour period. We're very happy with the output. As I say, we've got a a series of uh, settings on this equipment where we can even increase more and uh, at the moment as I say the current rate is about a million per day in eight hours it's about six to seven uh, trays per minute which each of them have 345 sales but that's our requirement at the moment that's the capacity that we need and we're, we're happy with that. So the process then from this line when the the tray has been seeded and watered and covered uh, it moves across to our uh, what we call rolling benches and what happens here these benches they hold 40 pieces of the the 345 cell um, so that equates to one of these benches holding th uh, 13,800 plants and you can see this line is semi-automatic so when this uh, bench is full for example we activate the green button and uh, this uh, line moves the entire bench 
the whole way to the end beside the red cart where we can go for a, another look. So what happens in this area when the full, when the full bench comes to the end, uh, we activate the, the pneumatics on the system, uh, which actually lowers the bench uh, down onto a separate type of rollers in an opposite direction, which allows us to very efficiently move the bench onto this cart. And what happens then, the operators basically move this cart at 90 degrees and uh, it's ready then in another direction to travel down to the growing area. Okay, so welcome to our uh, growing area, as we call it. Um, as you can see, uh, we have a series of bays within this uh, house. Uh, and every one of these bays holds approximately two and a half million seedlings. Um, these, uh, these seedlings were, were sown in uh, early June. Uh, and to date, we're quite happy with the, the progress that, that they're making. So as I said before, the plan for these, uh, these will be finding their way to the fields uh, in the autumn of, of this year. So some of the distinct advantages, as we can see, is compared to the field that this, these crops are way more consistent. Um, they're a lot more even. and. Another major advantage of this type of production is uh, when we remove these plants from this uh, growing facility, uh, we then take them to the field and we insert them into our uh, robotic planters. We, over the last two years, have invested in three of these machines. Very happy with them. To date, we have planted, uh, over the last couple of seasons, approximately 10 million uh, plugs that we had previously outsourced uh, so we know uh, the procedure and the method is proven uh, it has shown us uh, great benefits um, as we talked about earlier the the grading of the plants the the, the processing of the plants in preparation for the customer um, so again that was another decision or another factor to the decision that we we made the investment um, because, it, again, that we have proven that it that adds to our, our quality on the nursery. we see in this area is uh, it's basically 30% of the area that we have inside. So approximately 7,000 square meters outside. The same type of uh, rail design where we can move our benches uh, full of plants. Uh, and this is what we call our standing out area or hardening area. You may be aware that uh, we have two sites. We have um, a site in Scotland uh, and this current site in, in Wales. And our, our plan for production is that uh, half of the crop out of this facility will go to our other site in Scotland. And the other half will be lined up, as we call it, um, with our robotic planters. So I would just like to uh, take you through the presentation now. <coughs> um, and what you can see here uh, is basically our, our mini plug project, which is mid construction. That photo was taken uh, January, February this year. The huge uh, square or rectangle, if you like, um, is basically all of the growing area. And then if you see down on the, uh, or the top left sort of area there, you can see um, a section that we call the, the growing area. And then further on where the construction machinery is, you can see um, that's the area for the hardening or, or standing out area. So uh, the contents of this presentation, what do we do? Um, how do we get there? Why have we changed our, our method of production? 
Um, I look at our first crop in the controlled environment and the lessons uh, we have learned and, and where we go in the future. The photograph on the right is a shot taken from our, our, our site in Scotland. So what we do, we are, uh, we're a bear root nursery. Um, we, our crop establishment for plants is now changing to a more efficient process, we believe. Uh, the mini plug method away from traditional seed beds that we've seen on the field. We transplant uh, 280,000 uh, kilometers or sorry, meters of plants annually, and that's uh, five rows in a bed. And then in turn, we would harvest or, or lift the same amount annually. And the photograph on the right um, is quite typical of the process and the equipment that we use. Um, to, to bring our trees in. And then after harvesting or lifting, uh, trees are frozen uh, and processed later to, uh, to suit the customers. Uh, how do we get there? Um, any other nursery colleagues online will um, appreciate that uh, a first-class team is key. Um, and we're uh, very fortunate at Mailer that we have a very um, dedicated team um, we're passionate about our performance uh, and our quality at every operation. Um, we now have our new 25,000 meter or square meter greenhouse. Um, again, we'll incorporate the three units of the robotic planters. Each of these can put on about 120,000 plants per day each. And then through winter, we uh, proceed with uh, seven or eight teams. Um, and we're, we're lifting out sort of half a million plants uh, every day. So why the change? Um, you can see the, the photograph again. Uh, the older or traditional method is, is very labor intensive. Um, so we, we want to make better um, use of our labor. We want to give them better conditions to work in. Um, and that'll bring about efficiency uh, with the, the greenhouse and, and the other planting as well. We want efficiency in our grading and we want to give a, a better quality product uh, to our customers. And what I didn't mention before was the efficiency of the, the seed use. And all together, hopefully we um, can ensure better quality. So if we look at our, our first crop, um, we seeded these in the first week of June. Um, as I say, it was a bit late for the season, but uh, they've done really well. And they were sort of five, six centimeters after 12 weeks. And that, that was even with the, the very intense uh, heat um, at that time. We, you know, in this type of process, we get a one person looking after 10 million seedlings, which again is very efficient. Um, we have more efficient use of, of water uh, and nutrient. Um, you know, less soil erosion, less runoff, um, which we're, we can see the benefits of even in this short period. Um, we have the ability to harvest the rainwater off the roof of the greenhouse. So uh, we have six large tanks. Each of those have about 190 meters cube um, capacity. And uh, what we estimate is that we will use uh, 31,000 cube of um, water for a six month period, um, depending on what um, rainfall, but estimated um, that water usage will be uh, 30 or 40% uh, harvested water. So the visions in the future, um, a lot of people say to me, oh, this uh, greenhouse, it's a um, huge expansion. Well, actually it's, it's not, it's, um, it's a replacement or a, a change in the method of what we do. Um, but what I can say as well, that um, if we have the desire or the market, we can, you know, we, we can certainly in, increase our production quite easily. So hopefully the, the UK market will, will open up and um, we can at some point hopefully reach these afforestation targets. Um, 
which would be which would be great overall, not only for our industry but for a lot of others. Um, the money plug facility also gives us the potential to look at containerized stock, uh, which in turn then we could introduce uh, automation in the forest or mechanical planting in the forest, which would be a huge step again to mitigate against um, labor issues. So again, thank you for uh, your interest um, and coming online today. As I say, please send any questions into your, our Q&A box and um, I will hand you back to Ben now to continue um, and give you a, a further insight into our, our nursery. Thank you very much, Mark. So, yeah, very excited about the um, new mini plug facility there. Uh, it's yeah, quite a quite a big change to what we're doing. But for me uh, and for everyone here, really, it's it's been very. Um, what one of the really impressive things is how well the team have integrated it into what we're doing, and you know the, the benefits that it's already showing. Uh, so yeah, a key part of the business going forward. So what. I will do now is I will uh, give a quick, a very quick whistle stop tour um, around the nursery of all the um, other things that are happening in the field or most of the other things that are happening in the field. Um, I'll give a quick overview of our sites. I'll, I'll talk about what types of trees we grow uh, and then we'll have a, a, a short video uh, where we'll, we'll just try and get around and, and see some of the crops. Uh, so, uh, as you may be aware, we, we operate from two sites, uh, one in Scotland uh, in the Darnaway Forest and one down here in Wales on uh, the English-Welsh border uh, near Wrexham. So they're, they're two very different sites uh, in terms of size, history, soil type, layout, um, but that allows us to, uh, to spread our risk and, and grow accordingly, um, according to the strengths of the, the two sites. Um, and also from a logistics point of view, it, it's more efficient for, for covering uh, the whole of, of Great Britain. Um, it, up in Scotland, it's a fairly uh, new site. We, we took it on a few years ago and it, it wasn't a, a tree nursery prior to that. Uh, so the soil is quite, quite fresh. Um, because we were laying out the nursery from scratch, uh, it gave us the opportunity to, to you know, sort of to lay it out in quite an efficient uh, set up so we've got five uh, 70 hectares divided into five large fields uh, which lends itself to very efficient production of uh, lining out uh, and, and transplants so uh, we're growing about 15 million trees um, a year up there at the moment uh, and you know very happy with 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 how it's um, how it's going up there uh, we've got a new cold store grading facilities um, and uh, yeah so it, it, it's going well um, down in Wales, we're a larger site, 200 hectares compared to 70 up in Scotland. Um, a lot more moving parts down in Wales. So we grow 25 million trees down here. Um, in addition to the mini plug facility, which Mark's talked about, and the somatic embryogenesis lab, which, which she'll all talk about, we've also got seed stands, seed orchards, uh, seed processing facilities. We've got labs for testing. Um, our administrative and technical functions are, are based down here. Um, we've, we've got a lot number of trials which we do on site. So um, yeah, quite quite a lot of stuff happening on site here. Um, in terms of uh, sort of seed orchards, one of the things which Mailer is is well known for is our involvement in tree breeding. Uh, we're a founder member of the Conifer Breeding Cooperative, uh, which is uh, a public-private partnership uh, set up to uh, continue the, the tree breeding work that the Forestry Commission did initially in Sitka Spruce, but currently uh, working on establishing uh, tree breeding programs for Norway Spruce and Douglas Fir. Um, we've also got uh, broadleaf seed orchards using material uh, identified by the Future Trees Trust. Uh, so that's a, a charity focused on improvement of productive broadleaves. Um, I, I mentioned trials. We've got a number of trials on the nursery and a number of trials around the country. We work with, with others to 
to trial new technologies, uh, new processes, uh, really supporting different ways of, of doing things, trying to look into the future a little bit. So that covers things like um, alternative species, cover crops, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, different fertilizers, hylobius uh, treatments. So a, a lot of a lot of activities alongside the simple uh, business of growing trees um, in and around the sites and around the country. Um, but all aimed at you know, helping us grow better trees or the best trees we can uh, for, for now and in the future. So what kind of trees are those? Um, <laughs> we grow a lot of different trees. We grow a lot of trees, we grow a lot of different trees. Um, lots of different species, but also different provenances and different origins. Um, they're graded to different sizes depending on where they're going, you know, whether it's a, a new woodland creation scheme or, or a beat up, for example. Um, and different growing regimes depending on the crop uh, and what suits the crop best. So when you combine all those different variables, we, we grow well over a thousand different uh, sort of stock lines, if you like. Um, in terms of species, uh, we grow about 60 different species, um, probably evenly distributed between sort of broadleafs and conifers, and a mix of the more well-known species, so things like spruce, pine, um, Douglas fir, oaks, birches, alders, but also a lot of alternative species for um, specific objectives, uh, you know, things like conservation or simply to diversify the, the species mix. Uh, in terms of provenance uh, for broadleaves, we grow um, across most of the 24 GB native seed zones. But again, we also source material from um, specific sources, so seed orchards for, for productive um, timber crops, um, but also overseas um, sources for assisted uh, migration sort of future climate matching. Um, in terms of growing regime, so I've included this table here um, for the benefit of people who might not be familiar with them. So just a very quick overview. You can grow, uh, you can sow seed in either in the ground or in growing media, and it might stay in the soil um, in, in the ground for its whole life. So that might be a, a one year broadleaf or it might be a one new one. Douglas fir, for example, um, you can take that seedling and after one or two years, you can transplant it out into another field. So we refer to that as a transplant. Uh, so that might be a two plus one Sitka, for example, which is what you can see in this photo up here. Um, or you can uh, transplant it into containers, into growing media and containers, uh, typically or typically sort of 100 cc to 125 cc cells. Uh, cell grown production, uh, container grown production, uh, which you can pretty much plant all year round, particularly with the um, sort of the change in sort of the planting traditional bare root uh, planting season and weather, uh, and also you know the constraints we see around weather um, labour. We think that there'll there'll be a big uh, sort of increase in the demand for container grown stock. Um, we also do. Uh, we also grow trees from cuttings, uh, so most notably our full sibling Sitka spruce uh, crop. Sheila will talk a little bit more about that in her presentation. So, oh, a couple of points about quality um, and the quality of the trees that we grow. Um, as you know, as most of our colleagues will know, uh, growing trees is is about working with nature. So it's as much about uh, sort of the art of growing and you know reacting to changing uh, circumstances in terms of weather or um, different you know different changes in legislation as much as it is about sort of planning and hard technical uh, sort of procedures. So we are very lucky, as, as Mark said, we've got a very um, passionate, very experienced team, so they can they can foresee and plan for most of uh, the issues which will come. But what we also do is uh, we choose to get our quality management systems uh, audited annually. So that's our ISO 9001 certification. Um, 
And we do the same for our environmental management system. So that's our ISO 14001 certification. And really for me, that, that has two main benefits. One, it helps us to manage the complexity of, of what we're trying to do, all these different crops, all the different practices, all the different activities we've got going on. But two, it also supports a, a culture of you know, continuous improvement and, and a review of what we're doing, why we do it, is it working? So that's that's really important for us at, at Mailer, and it's a big part of who we are. Um, another big part of who we are and what we do is biosecurity. So I suppose one of the main, well, possibly the main threat uh, which faces our, our forests and our woodlands and, and, and the trees on the nursery are pests and diseases. And the main vector for those coming into uh, Great Britain as, as an island uh, are imported uh, trees and plants. So we don't buy in or, or, or trade in trees. Um, apart from you know a, a number of small trials, you know all our stock is, stock is grown on site, and, and that works well in terms of um, sort of keeping pest and disease off the nursery. So what I'll do now is I'll play a short video uh, which will whiz us around the nursery, and we'll have a look at some of the crops. Again, we won't look at every single um, field and every single crop, uh, but hopefully uh, it'll it'll give a flavour of what we're doing out there. So we're here uh, looking at some of the mini plugs, uh, mini plugs which were lined out in May this year. So as we're filming only about two months ago, um, already you can see they've, they've flushed quite nicely. What we're going to do is we're going to dig some up and just have a look at the, the roots. So you can see there, that was lined out two months ago. Uh, it would have been I don't know, 10 centimetres when it was lined out. Uh, you can just see the original plug there, but the root growth in two months. And the, the growth of the plant, you know, 2050 in there. Lots of, lots of fine root growth, a good root colour on there. 7mm root collar, and that's a fine tree already, um, ready for going out. So what we're looking at here is some of our two-year-old seedlings which were lined out I think in May, June this year up in our Scottish nursery. Um, they'll grow on for another year, so they'll be for next season, winter 23-24. Um, what we've got for comparison, also up on the Scottish nursery, are some two plus one transplants so they were lined out at the same time last year and you can see the difference um you know the, the growth they've put on so these will be lifted this season probably graded 30 50 50 70. Uh, this is some of our norway spruce crop again for this season uh, so uh, i think we're looking at a danish um, seed orchard um, origin here uh, but we also grow um, other other European seed orchard um, sources. As I mentioned, the conifer breeding co-op are um, establishing a, a British, a, a GB, uh, Norway spruce program. So one to watch there. This is our Douglas fir crop, a 1U1 Douglas fir crop. Um, uh, it's, yeah, planted in 2021. Uh, Douglas is quite sensitive to being transplanted. So hence we, we tend to grow it as a one you one and then we've refined that process over the years and it tends to respond quite well to that. Um, we grow from a, a range of seed orchards as well as um, sort of native, uh, uh, native uh, sort of US sources. Scots pine also grown on a one you one. Um, and, and for me, the pines, Scots pine, lodgepole pine have, have been some of the standout crops this season. We had a we had a very good uh, back end to last season and the beginning of this season. So they've put on some of the best growth we've seen. 
Uh, again, we grow from uh, native sources, so Caledonian, Scots pine, as well as from UK uh, tested seed orchards. Uh, and yeah, very, very happy with the, um, the pine crop this year. Uh, we've got a small selection of uh, one plus one uh, transplanted uh, native broadleaves up here on the Scottish nursery, or up there on the Scottish nursery. Um, these were transplanted out in, I think, June this year. So and I think this video was, was shot as we were um, lining them out. So a bit more growth um, to be put on there. Uh, these were transplanted using a, ah, there you go, you can just see it there. So a conventional five disc um, transplanting machine. Uh, there, these are Scottish provenance, um, Alder and Birch. And, but as I mentioned, we, we grow probably about 30 different species of broadleaves, some of them as one year um, species down on the nursery in Wales. Uh, but these will these will be lifted this season and make a good, I would say, yeah, there's some good 40, 60s, um, 2040s in there as well. So we've got some images here of our silver birch seed orchard uh, referred to as OR15. Um, it was established in 2013, uh, contains clones of uh, 37 plus trees selected by the Future Trees Trust from across Northern England, Southern Scotland. So um, very suitable for planting uh, in Northern Britain, really. Um, display improved growth and form, uh, had a very good harvest of, of seed last year. Uh, we've got a range of different uh, other seed orchards and seed stands um, across the nursery, so lodgepole pine, uh, we've got Douglas fir, Scots pine, sycamore, um, and we've got more in the pipeline, uh, really aimed at giving us the best uh, seed sources and, and, and security around, uh, around seed supply. Um, again, these were from the Future Trees Trust, that, those sycamore um, clones. I'll finish here with uh, an image of our Sitka spruce seed orchard, uh, referred to as A22. Uh, this was planted between 2009 and 2013, uh, and it features our own around 1,200 trees made up of 35 different clones uh, from the Forestry Commission breeding program, which I talked about a bit earlier. Um, as you can see, it's laid out in two blocks with all the clones represented in each block, um, and we collected about a ton of cones from it last season. So those were some of the, or they were the first seed that were actually sown in the mini plug facility earlier this year. Um, in selecting which clones went into the seed orchard, we focused on uh, straightness and branching. So the uh, tested gains for uh, form for, for the A22 orchard are 21% compared to unimproved planting stock uh, and diamond gains of 12% with, with no loss in density. So that was a very quick um, tour around the nursery. Um, if you want to know more about the nursery, there's a, there's a link to our, our, our email address. You can get in touch and find out more, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of, of, of what we're doing. Um, just talking about sort of the seed orchard and tree breeding at the end there um, leads nicely into uh, Sheila's talk, um, where she'll talk a little bit about uh, tree breeding and our somatic embryogenesis lab. Um, Sheila is our science R&D manager, and she uh, looks after the somatic embryogenesis lab. She joined us uh, in July last year uh, from Forest Research, uh, and she'll talk about how somatic embryogenesis contributes to uh, what we're trying to do in terms of getting the best genetics out there and also contributing to uh, tree improvement. If you don't know anything about somatic embryogenesis, don't worry, as Sheila will explain all. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about somatic embryogenesis, and I'll start off by sharing my screen for my presentation. So as Ben said, I'm the science R&D manager for Mela Forest Nurseries, and the main aims of my job are to manage and to future-proof our somatic embryogenesis lab, which plays a key role in our tree breeding program. So Mayla Forest Nurseries is the only tree nursery in Britain with its own somatic embryogenesis lab. It was started a few years ago with input from Dr. David Thompson, 
formerly a researcher at Culture in Ireland. But in 2019, we built a larger lab where we're in the process of scaling up production to meet customer demands for genetically improved trees. The tree weeding is key to adapting to changing climates and markets. There are three stages. Firstly, we select plus trees from the natural so-called gene population. Secondly, we breed for specific character traits, such as faster growth, better form, and stronger timber. And then we test the progeny field trials. And lastly, we deploy the improved trees to our customers. Tree breeding is a very long process with each generation spanning 20 to 30 years, largely due to the long life cycle of the trees. But somatic hemogenesis in combination with DNA techniques, which link molecular markers to specific traits can potentially reduce the cycle by 10 years or more. Now, usually trees are produced from open pollinated seeds, which occur naturally due to wind. But in order to capture specific character traits, we do controlled crosses each year. So we hand pollinate female flowers in our seed orchard, which results in full sub seeds with known pedigrees or breeding values. The problem is that control pollination is very labor intensive and only produces a few thousand seeds. It's also influenced by weather. For instance, female flowers sometimes abort when exposed to late frost or high temperatures during key developmental stages. So these elite seeds are generally used to produce stock plants, which are then planted into stock hedges where cuttings are taken each year. But there's several challenges. Firstly, it takes several years to establish stock hedges, which then have a relatively short lifespan. And secondly, the cuttings lose vigor over time. In addition, cuttings are often slow to establish in the field. So to overcome these problems, we use an advanced vegetative technology known as somatic hemogenesis to produce thousands of clones of our leaf seeds. These somatic embryos are all identical copies of the original seed. Somatic hemogenesis is a complex process with several stages where we attempt to mimic natural seed development under lab conditions. And there are five main stages, cell line initiation, callus proliferation, embryo induction and maturation, germination and acclimation. At the moment, we are focusing largely on Sitka spruce, but we also have a hybrid a Sitka white cross. And this cross known as a Lutz spruce occurs naturally where the two distribution ranges overlap and is potentially more drought tolerant than Sitka spruce. So we're going to show you a short video um, introducing you to the lab and telling you more about somatic imagenesis. Welcome to the David Thompson Somatic Imagenesis Lab. I would like to introduce you to my team who will take you on a journey through the process of somatic embryogenesis. I'm Danielle Stoddart and I'm a crop technician here at Baylor. Part of my role is to oversee the cross pollinations on the seed orchard. Hello, I'm Ian Taylor and I'm the lab technician. My favourite stage is post initiation because you make a lot of plates and I like chasing targets. Hi, I'm Marta Patrick, I'm the lab assistant. Uh, my favourite part of the job is new cell line initiation because it allows me to work with the microscope. Hi, I'm Lucy Mwale and I'm the lab assistant. My favourite part of the job is desiccation because I find it therapeutic and I enjoy searching for perfect embryos. Hello, my name is Henryka Petnowska, I'm lab assistant. I like transplanting because I see the result of my job. I'm Lee Vadkins and I'm a student. I find seed extraction very interesting because I like to see how the process of somatic embryogenesis starts. The process of somatic embryogenesis starts in the seed orchard. Each year we collect pollen from known fathers, test it for viability and then store it until required. In April or May we isolate female flowers of our target trees just before the cone scales open to prevent any background contamination. We eject the pollen into the isolation tubes and then a few months later we harvest the immature cones. 
Timing is absolutely critical, as there's a very narrow window for successful pollination. Back in the lab, we extract the seeds from the cones, float off empty seeds, disinfect the filled seeds in a weak solution of bleach to prevent any contamination by bacteria or fungi, and then carefully dissect out the embryos from individual seeds under a microscope. Each year, we excise several hundreds of embryos over a three to four week window to capture the correct developmental stage for cell line initiation. Not all embryos produce the right type of callus. Cell line initiation is a very fiddly process that requires good hand-eye coordination and a great deal of patience, sometimes with little return, particularly where there are high numbers of empty seeds. The embryos are then placed onto media that contains all the macro and micronutrients that act as building blocks for the cells, but also contains a powerful synthetic auxin 2,4-D, which triggers uncontrolled growth resulting in callus. This callus is simply a mass of plant cells, somewhat similar to stem cells, or in other words, raw material that can divide to produce more and more cells, which in turn can differentiate into specialised cells depending on lab conditions. The bottom line is that each of these cells has the potential to form a tree. The callus is bulked up by microselecting for vigorous callus and subculturing onto fresh media until there's enough to move into the production stage. We then place the callus into liquid media, shake it, and then spread it over filter paper, which results in a thin layer of vigorous callus. This promotes synchronization of the later stages. After a few weeks, this callus is transferred to media containing ABA, a natural plant growth regulator, which triggers the formation of hundreds of embryos. These embryos grow and grow, following a similar developmental pathway to those embryos in seeds. The embryos are then dried back slightly and then moved onto media with no plant growth regulators, where they germinate to form emblings. When these emblings have well-developed shoots and roots, we prick out the plants into mini plug trays for hardening off. Hardening off is a critical stage because the emblings are susceptible to drying out. So we gradually reduce the relative humidity and increase the light intensity in the growth room until they are climatized to ambient conditions. So that gives you a short introduction to the process of somatic homogenesis. What I'll do now is discuss some of the challenges um, that occur in the lab. So, One of the challenges is contamination by bacteria and fungi, uh, which is a constant risk in the lab as these microorganisms flourish on the sucrose rich media. So our team members are very vigilant about working cleanly on the bench, swabbing it down with alcohol and heat sterilizing the forceps between cultures. We also fumigate the lab weekly to reduce the spore load. Accessibility is also important. So each plate has a label which contains details of the family, the cell line, the receipt number when the cone was collected, and the date of the subculture, ensuring that there's an order trail back to the original single seed that produced the cell line. In addition, as part of the FRM regulations, the cell lines will be DNA barcoded, which will serve as a unique identifying fingerprint. A key challenge is that somatic homogenesis is very labor intensive, especially at stages where individual embryos or emblems are handled. So a critical part of my role is to automate the process so as to improve efficiency, scale up production, reduce labor input, and improve the survival rate of emblems. At the moment, we are testing various bioreactors which are essentially mini factories for producing callus and embryos. There are two main types of bioreactors, constant immersion bioreactors, where the cultures are immersed in the media continuously, as shown on the left, 
and temporary immersion bioreactors, where as the name suggests, the cultures are immersed in the media for short durations, um, shown in the middle and on the right hand side. At a later stage, we'll automate the deployment and handling of embryos and embryos using robotics or fluidics. Another challenge is the perception that somatic embryogenesis will lead to large scale monocultures, thereby reducing the genetic diversity and increasing susceptibility to abiotic and biotic factors. But these risks can be managed by establishing new cell lines annually and by adopting mosaic planting of families, each with several cell lines. And this approach means that foresters can exploit the predicted gains of a family and also retain high levels of genetic diversity within a block. So in a nutshell, somatic immogenesis enables us to capture the benefits of traditional vegetative propagation by cuttings and produce thousands of clones or identical copies of trees with a known pedigree, but without the hassle of producing stock plants and stock hedges. And this results in a quicker turnaround time from the leaf seed to the emblings. So for instance, we could select a disease resistant or drought tolerant clone, bulk it up and deploy it far more rapidly to, to the market than any other technique. And this will benefit our customers by enabling them to pivot more quickly in response to changing climate or market conditions. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sheila. So that was uh, the Somatic Embryogenesis Lab and um, a bit more information about free breeding and improvement and, and what it can offer. Um, so a really important innovation for us, which you know we view as being a key enabler for um, future uh, for future tree um, deployment, uh, for future tree breeding, uh, and, and an example of one of the other um, activities that we're doing. You know, targeting uh, just providing better trees. So that's the end of the presentations. Um, at this point, what we'll do is we'll. Uh, open up for questions. So if I could ask Mark and Sheila to turn their cameras on, come back on. Um, I'd like to introduce Georgina Thomas from our marketing team who will run the question and answer session. Um, Georgina, over to you. Wonderful. We've got quite a few questions, quite a few for Mark. So I'll start off with Hester's question who asks, what are the walls made of um, in the mini pug facility, Mark? Yeah. So. Uh, what we have, or what we uh, designed was a forestry spec uh, wall covering, um, and it's des described technically as a foil. And the characteristics of this is um, that the idea is to, to block out the direct uh, UV sunlight uh, and to create a, a cool, dull type of environment inside. And uh, we can tell, you know, we can tell already that this is very effective because um, early on in the summer we have the the opening roof feature as you've seen as well, uh, and there's one particular point in the morning uh, where the sun is very strong and was able to to enter through one of the sections on the open roof, and we had actually seen a negative effect on on the plants within that strip within the house. Um, but it, it just seems to be for a, a very brief period at a particular time of the day. So, um, so overall, um, yeah, the foil covering is it's it's quite good, really. Thank you. Um, this one, Ben. What do you see as the main risk to all tree nurseries? Um, <laughs> there's lots of them. Uh, as I mentioned, pest and disease. And you can imagine if you know if, if we get something onto the nursery that can um, that can damage a crop uh, or damage multiple crops. The weather is always a worry. Um, things like uh, dry springs, late frosts, um, they can all have quite pretty you know pretty dramatic impacts. But as Mark was talking about, you know the you know the mini plug facility helps to address. Some of those uh, it actually helps to address quite a lot of the risks we face. I mean, labor is 
is a big issue for everybody, not just for nurseries, but we're, we're quite labor intensive. Um, there's always a changing landscape around what chemicals we can use um, that affects the way we do things. But you know, we, we, we're used to reacting to those kinds of things. I suppose from a uh, from a business point of view, you know, it's if, if there are big changes in policy, and you know, suddenly for whatever reason, there's you know a change in the demand for trees. Well, you know, those trees are in the ground, and and that can have quite a big impact if, if suddenly we can't send those trees out. So lots of different risks but that is the nature of the nursery it's you know our job is to plan ahead and try and foresee all those things we don't always get it right but you know we, we do our best uh we've got a couple of similar questions in here from olivia fitzgerald and aston crouch for for you mark how did the plants cope with being planted out in the outdoors after being in the control facility and do they miss the mini plug luxury environment <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question actually. Um, I would say initially, yes. Um, they, but again, another key feature of our growing facility is that we have a lot of air movement um, within the house from the open roof. We also have fans in there as well. So what we have seen this season is while they have been growing in luxury, if you like, um, they actually, while they grow, they lignify as well. Um, and that's a, a distinct advantage uh, over a glass covered operation, if you like, because um, while they grow steadily, um, they, they don't grow so soft. Um, and then when we come to the stage where they're ready to come outside, we, we change the nutrient plan. Um, and then also we have the, the standing out area, which will make them harder again. But in our experience over the last three or four years of handling uh, these plugs, what I would say is that when they are transplanted to the field, uh, within days, they actually put on more root, they, they break the plug. And quite easily, they can put on two or three millimeters of, of fresh root within days in the field, which helps to, um, you know, to anchor them. And it, it helps as well for them to get away uh, compared to a bare root seedling that has been sort of ripped out of the ground and put back in the ground again. Uh, that's much slower to, to put on new root and, and pull away. There was a situation a couple of years ago where we had um, some plugs side by side uh, with some bare root seedlings and there was a marked uh, step in the field where the, the plugs were significantly better. Wonderful, thank you. Um, how do you control pests and diseases, particularly reducing chemical footprints on the environment? I think that's one for you as well, Mark, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, again, we, we've seen our biggest exposure um, for pests and disease, um, and I suppose environmental conditions, uh, by depending on growing all of our production outside. Um, we feel as well that we have much better efficiency uh, and use, and actually a reduced application um, and we can get better results inside the controlled environment with more bio products so we're, we're quite encouraged by that um there's some similar questions how are you controlling weeds in the mini plug production with limited chemical options Mark? um actually well at the moment we had a small infestation but we were able to control these uh, with a couple of people um just manually taking them out and our current uh i suppose growth cycle or, or growth plan um actually the plugs won't be in that environment as long as they would be in the field so overall we don't have the same exposure great thank you uh ashley meredith wants to know who our customer base is or your customer base is ben 
Um, uh, anybody who buys trees, anybody who plants trees. So um, I suppose a lot of you know, forestry management companies, a lot of estates, um, farmers for planting hedging or, or putting some forestry on their site. Uh, we, we work with a lot of conservation um, bodies and charities, uh, the local wildlife trust. Um, yeah, we, we anybody who you know buys trees. I mean, we we don't we don't grow um, so standard trees or big kind of one and a half meter, two meter trees or or things in pots. So we don't supply to places like garden centres and stuff like that. But you know, sort of small trees for woodland and forestry planting. Uh, you, you'd be surprised who who our customers are. Yeah. Mark, we've had a couple of questions about peat. Are you able to use peat-free compost for the mini plugs? And if so, yeah. do the do the alternatives? So I've just lost it because it jumps up every time someone writes a new one in. Um, and if so, do the alternatives perform as well as peat? Yeah. Well, what what we have used um, this season. Uh, We've, we've used a, a peat-based uh, media, if you like, um, because we, you know, on the nursery, we're, we're all learning and we, we wanted the crop established quickly um, and we couldn't avoid any failure or couldn't afford any failure. So uh, we played it safe this time. Uh, but what we are doing, we are uh, trialing um, reduced peat mixtures and peat-free mixtures. And we will know um, at the end of the season, which of these uh, can perform as well or can perform better. But in our other conventional containerized uh, production, we are already using um, reduced peat uh, mixes that, in fairness, do seem to retain moisture and give um, acceptable results. So we'll, we will pursue that going forward. Great, thank you. We've got uh, quite a few more for you, Mark. What is the labour reduction for the mini plug versus traditional planting in the field? Um, I would say the crop establishment, it's, it's probably fairly similar, um, but where the efficiency or reductions would come in um, I would be from post-emergence. Um, through to post planting. And I reckon that we can see a 30% reduction in labor. And, you know, what I say to people as well, you know, at Mailer, we are not shy about employing people, but I just see for the sustainability of the, the nursery business in general, um, you know, certainly how we operate today with uh, being very manual, that's so unsustainable for me because simply the people won't be there to employ. So um, we're, we're forced into more automation and, and mechanization to become sustainable. Emily has asked, where do you source your seeds, please, Ben? Um, so if we break it down, so for um, conifers, Broadly speaking, we're, we're talking about seed orchard material, improved sources. Um, so, for example, Sitka spruce, uh, a lot of it comes from uh, UK tested seed orchards. A lot of those um, operated by the Forestry Commission. Uh, we also uh, have a seed orchard. Um, there are seed orchards around Europe and around the world. Um, so, for example, Norway spruce. Uh, I mentioned Danish. Uh, we've got Swedish, French, Czech. Uh, German, uh, all over the shop for, for the conifers, a, a lot from uh, sort of their, their native uh, ranges, so a lot from sort of the northwest Pacific coast uh, on, on, the, uh, on uh, the US and Canada. Um, for broadleaves, we work with um, seed collectors all around the country, so um, yeah, so the seed collectors are collecting from uh, seed stands, uh, sort of wild populations, estates um, all around the country. Again, from seed orchards, I mentioned the work that the Future Trees Trust has done. Um, uh, we buy from seed houses and uh, seed traders um, in the UK and, and across the world. So, yeah, I think we, we buy from pretty much anywhere, um, anywhere that we have a known provenance 
and it you know it it fits for an objective that somebody's trying to to plan for great thank you sheila what kind of trees can be grown using somatic embryogenesis so there's no real limitation um the process has been used widely for various spruces and pines um but it's also been used for broadleaves for instance oak great thank you uh, one for you, Mark. At uh, what stage do you apply treatments and fertilisers? Yeah, so because we are, um, it's quite technical really, but because we are using a mix of uh, rainwater and also mains water, um, what we do, we, we analyse this um, and we also um, analyse, I suppose, I don't want to give too many secrets away, but we look we look at the EC of the water and we, we basically feed um, to what the plants uh, need um, constantly there and then. So it's a it's a constant uh, monitor um, and it's a constant feed, if you like, uh, because they're I suppose they're just like babies. Um, and, you know, so it's it's a constant process. Um, but again, I do feel that we have much more control. We have much more um, efficiency in terms of using less overall nutrient, which is great. Ben, are you trialing any species for future climate change? Yes, yes. So um, I suppose one, th one thing that we didn't talk about, uh, he'd rather, Sheila mentioned it, was the hybrid um, Lutz spruce or hybrid white spruce, spruce uh, hybrid. Um, so that's uh, that's aimed at um, future climate, particularly on sort of the east coast of the country and, and sort of better um, better tolerance for reduced rainfall, um, which we expect to see, you know, over on, on the east side of the country. It, it's worth saying in terms of future climate matching, there's no one size fits all. It depends on what kind of site you have, where in the country you are, what kind of time scale you're thinking about. You know, are you growing for, you know, for, for timber on a 30, 40 year rotation, or are you, you know, planting for um, sort of rewilding and biodiversity over a kind of century kind of time scale? Um, so on on broad leaves, again, as I mentioned, we're sourcing from you know, more southerly uh, climates, uh, which match sort of the current whose current climate match what we expect to see you know over the the, the next kind of 30 50 100 years um, so we're also trialing a range of alternative conifers for diversification of uh, commercial forestry so um, things like pacific silver fir japanese red cedar um, lowes fir you know lots of different species uh, that we're, we're trialing so yeah always always something going on always something interesting happening uh, Josh Phillips has asked, the cost of young commercial trees has risen markedly, nearly 100% from his experience over the last few years. What has been the main driver of this cost increase, i.e. increased demand but limited supply, labour costs, etc.? One for you, Mark. Ben. Oh. <laughs> Do you want, if you want to go, Mark, you go. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Ben. Um, <laughs> I think altogether um, like any other business in more recent times is um, operational costs cost of inputs cost of labor um, but what i would touch on as well is that you know certainly when i came to the industry i you know i felt a deep frustration that um, probably trees had been uh, let's say very good value for money um, traditionally and we're you know um even though they are a major factor in a forestry investment they they were probably the the cheapest element of it so um but i you know i think the main driver is uh more so in recent times just with um general costs of of energy and, and labor and, and resource really I, if I could just add to that, so as Mark said, there there are underlying costs. You know, there there's a there's a correction which needed to happen because it it, it wasn't sustainable 
you know, no one was going to invest um, sort of going forward and sort of continue in the, the, the nursery sector. But as you can see from, you know, the talk today and what's happening around the wider sector, there's a huge amount of investment which needs to happen, A, to produce the trees we need now, but B, to be thinking ahead for the future. You know, the work that Sheila's doing, the work that we're doing in the mini plug facility on the nursery, yes, it's about growing trees, but it's mainly about thinking about the future. And that's the investment which we need to make today because trees take a very long time to grow. Breeding programs take decades. So um, it's what, what, you're, what you're seeing is, you know, the cost of, of providing those options for the future. Sheila, I've got a couple of questions for you. How do you manage genetic diversity of full sibling Sitka? So what we do is um, we have our seed orchards with several hundreds or thousands of clones and we do control crosses each year, but we don't repeat the crosses each year. So we use different parents, different mothers and fathers each year to, to make sure that we have a, a good range of diversity um, in our lab. Um, it's also important to realize that each cone will contain several seeds and we will have more than likely more than one cell line or hopefully about 10 or more cell lines of each family. Um, so, so that's one way of managing the genetic, uh, genetic diversity. The other way is making sure that we um, use mosaic planting. So we plant in blocks, but we, we use as many cell lines as we can from a, from a particular family so that we can get all the genetic gains, uh, but without reducing the genetic diversity too much. Also, Sheila, when do you estimate the M-Links will be available commercially? That's from Lorenza. So we've just lined out um, a small section of plants um, or M-Links uh, in, in the field. So I guess they'll spend a, a year there. Then we'll probably be able to track on this a year there and it should be ready to be graded end of next year. Yeah. Um, and we've also sent um, a small number of trays out to the new Polyhouse um, facility, mini plug facility, um, and that will follow a similar pattern. Great, thank you. Stuart Glenn has asked, what do you do with your spent growing medium? Um, he recalls a preliminary, preliminary study from forest research that found Phytophthora by, by and other pathogens persisted in spent growing medium piles. Mark, one for you. Yeah, um, so, Thankfully for us, um, most of the media that we use, um, you know, actually goes out with the tree or, or uh, goes to the customer, to the forest. But any waste the media that we do have on the nursery, um, we treat it like, I think someone asked the question there about spent trees as well. We, um, we do our best to segregate these uh, away from our, our main growing areas and uh, try to compost and use natural heat um, to break down any pathogens uh, and manage it in that way. But of course, the, the biggest mitigation is to, is to reduce it in the first place, which um, we're, we're very aware about. Um, someone did ask earlier, what do you do with any leftover trees that aren't sold? Um, one for you, Ben. Yeah, so I... That is one of one of the main sort of challenges that we kind of work on through the season. It, it's trying to minimise that. So wherever possible, you know, we've, we've put a lot of effort into into you know sourcing the seed, and preparing the fields, growing the trees, um, grading them. So we don't want to uh, we don't want to have trees left over. So we'll, we'll work with customers. Uh, we'll work with um, sort of uh, charities and community trusts to make sure that we can try and find a home for those trees. Uh, but any that we do have left over, and invariably there are a few at the end of the season, um, they'll, they'll get mulched, as, as Mark was saying, um, sort of mulched and sort of disposed of. Great, thank you. Do you think bare root nurseries have a limited future with the loss of basamid? Do you pronounce it like that? Basamid and the reduced chemical options will force sale grown production. Mark? Um. I suppose it depends on the scale, um, certainly on the scale that we operate, yes, um, you know, that's why we, we made our investment and we, we went on the, the journey because there's no way that uh, for the number of trees that we produce annually that we would be sustainable. Um, and again, 
the controlled environment, as I said before, it actually allows us to uh, reduce our dependence on, on synthetic uh, pesticides. Okay, thank you. James Cryer has asked, what type of analysis do you do with DNA barcodes? Is this done in-house? Do you use methods such as QTL mapping, quantitative traits, low key, or marker assisted selection to identify genotypes with useful characteristics for successful growth in forestry? If so, what type of programs are used to analyze the data? Who would like to take that? I'll, I'll take that. So, um, <laughs> so, so at the moment we um, have outsourced our uh, DNA barcoding, uh, we have used um, DNA microsatellites. Um, in the future, we hope to explore doing it in-house using nanopore sequencing. Um, it's all very new to us, so um, we haven't got as far as any of the mark-assisted um, selection or anything else at this stage. Um, that, that type of work is being done um, through the Conifer Co-op and, and associate members. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we've covered Pete, but there is a couple more. Are you using Pete, which you've already covered, haven't you, Mark? Yeah. Um, Jake missed the question on climate, future climate predictions, which uh, will be in the recording from when Ben mentioned earlier. We've only got time for one more question. Um, Hester has also asked, do you see in the future bespoke matching of trees for individual project sites as a, at a more granular level, or is the future too uncertain? to make this a sensible. Ben? Um, we, that's a, that's a good question. We, we do see a degree of that already. Um, so we, we might get contacted by specific customers who want to um, preserve, a, a, you know, preserve, for example, birch, which grows on their site they want to collect seed from that, grow that on, and you know because it's associated to a specific uh, moth or butterfly, for example. Um, so we do see that. I mean, it's there is there is you know a place for that. I I could I could see that happening on some sites, but then I would counter that with what we're talking about in terms of future climate matching, and you know actually is. Is there a need to be thinking about bringing in um, new genetic sort of material, new sort of um, fresh sort of um, material onto site? That is a debate for each, you know, each individual to have um, themselves about, you know, what their objectives are and what what their constraints are. Um, but I think there is definitely a place for that. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy because you've got to have a sort of a very bespoke sort of chain of custody. Um, for managing things, um, but it's it's certainly something that we do a bit of. Yeah. And to end, you mentioned earlier, Ben, about Britain being an island and it being a benefit when controlling importing uh, pests and diseases. Do you think there is a big export market for UK tree producers? Uh, potentially, um, potentially. I mean, you know, we it's easy to <laughs> it, it's easy to to think on our own little island um, about you know what we're doing in terms of tree planting but but actually you know the same initiatives are, are taking place uh, around the world uh, and there's definitely expertise um, capabilities which we have here on, in, in the UK and in Britain which you know are in demand um, uh, elsewhere in the world so for example you know the work that Sheila's doing um, you know the, the quality of of the spruce uh, that we produce in in Great Britain so yes, definitely we see that. Perfect, thank you. I think that is all the questions. If we have missed any, obviously people can email and I will pass back to you, Ben, to close today. Okay, thank you very much, Regina. Um, and thank you everybody who's joined us today. Thanks for, for the questions. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available for, for everybody who signed up. Um, so just a couple of quick points uh, in summary. So as, as we mentioned, you know, what we do here on the nursery, it's it's very much about uh, you know, quality and it's about looking into the future. Uh, so yeah, the, the activities 
and the sort of the um, the topics which we've covered today hopefully give you a, a flavour of that. Um, as I said, we weren't we weren't able to cover everything, um, but if you know you're interested in finding out more, please do get in contact. Um, our I think our email address will be on the the slide at the end. Um, I suppose a thank you very much to Mark and Sheila for their presentations uh, and to Georgina and the rest of the team who've been making it all work and run smoothly behind the scenes. Uh, and yes, if you've got any other questions, please, please do uh, get in touch. But thank you very much for your time today. Mm -hmm.